I'm Lisa Dahl, health and well-being coach. Welcome to Getting Healthy Without Rules. This show is about understanding the things that impact your wellness and finding ways to improve it. In this show, we take a non-diet, no-rules approach to health and wellness. Health and wellness is a moving target. We all have different needs and opportunities to improve it. This approach allows you to make the best choice with the information you have right now. It helps you to be present, flexible, and resilient. In addition, I support you in moving from judgment to curiosity and offering yourself self-compassion. It is time we are all a little kinder to ourselves. Today's episode is about mindful eating. While you might have heard the terms mindfulness and mindful eating casually used, their true roots, origins, and immense impact often remain hidden. Mm -hmm. These practices can heal our busy minds and reshape our connection to food, body image, and self-care. Mindfulness originated over 2,600 years ago with the teachings of the Buddha. Mindfulness practices was an integral part of his eightfold path to end suffering. Since the 1980s, mindfulness has made a contemporary comeback, transforming how we approach suffering from pain, anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. Mindful eating, a practice rooted in mindfulness, invites us to engage with our meals in a present-centered and non-judgmental way. We foster a healthier relationship with food by turning into our senses, thoughts, and feelings during meals. This practice heightens our awareness of hunger and fullness cues, deepens our understanding of our body's nutritional needs, and encourages conscious eating decisions. The result is a reduction in overeating and a boost to our overall well-being. Today, I invite you to join me and my guest as we dive into the core of this transformative practice. Together, we'll explore how it empowers us to, cu to cultivate a thoughtful and harmonious connection with our bodies and food choices. By embracing mindfulness, we equip ourselves with the tools to navigate life's complexities with clarity, kindness, and the freeing power of self-regulation. We will explore what is mindfulness, what is mindful eating, how disordered eating has become normalized, and what happens when we finally take weight off the table. When the discussion lends itself to food and bodies, please note that we may use the words fat or larger bodied. For example, you can be in a fat body and accept your body and be healthy. We use these words as simple descriptors without judgment. Fat is simply another adjective like thin, and it's up to us to remove the stigma and the negative connotation that society and diet culture have created. Be sure to stay until the end for this week's healthy practice, and I'm excited to introduce today's expert guest, Alice Rosen. Alice has a Master's of Science in Education and is a mindfulness-based mental health counselor and educator specializing in disordered eating. She has a private practice in Concord, Massachusetts. Alice is on the faculty of the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy and is the founder of No Diet Workshops, Coming to Our Senses About Food, Body, and Power, Self-Led Eating, and The Conscious Cafe. She is the former director of education for Feeding Ourselves, a former board member, and now on the advisory council for the Center for Mindful Eating. In addition, Alice has had a meditation practice since 1973 and is trained in internal family systems. Alice, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lisa. I'm very happy to be here. I'm so excited to finally meet you in person. Mm -hmm. And we became connected through the Center for Mindful Eating, yes. a yes. place that I know holds a very special place yes. in your heart. Yes. Yes. So we will talk about that. Yeah. Um, so tell me, you have such an extensive background in mindfulness, meditation, and mindful eating. What first sparked your interest in this field? It's a long story, which I'm going to try to keep short. I started meditating in around 1973 only because other people were doing it. I was a leaf in the wind. I had no idea why I was doing it. And what I discovered in meditating was this sense of freedom or life, hope, maybe some awe, feelings I had never felt before. I was rather dead. And so I just kept doing it. Um, and then in 1979, I was attending a mindfulness retreat at Insight Meditation Society, and I was really dedicating myself to the practice because my life was going to change, and I knew this was my probably last long retreat. And I decided to practice with all full intention. 
And during eating, I remembered from a time past that someone said, notice the intention to pick up your utensil while eating. There was never been any instruction about mindful eating. Mindful eating didn't exist at that point. And so I decided to do that. And to my utter dismay, I discovered that at some point, I had no intention to pick up the utensil again. And more than half of my food was still on the, t on the table, food which I would have eaten and eaten and wanted more of. And I, I simply couldn't believe it. And I thought I had discovered something. And uh, what I discovered in myself that I was the locus of knowing enough. I was freed from the compulsion. And um, later, as I thought about it, being in the moment stopped craving. So I had literally discovered how to eat by being the boss of myself. And it n happened naturally for you. That's the point. And yeah. I assume I'm a rather just normal person. If it could happen to me, it could happen to anyone. So that's why I devoted my life to trying to recreate that situation for people having them be very quiet while eating and see what happens. That's what the Conscious Cafe is about. It's so interesting how when we just let ourselves be with quieting the noise that our own innate expertise has a chance to bubble up. And when we follow that intuition, you know, magical things actually do happen. I used to call it magic. I mean, it is. It's the intuition. You can call it any than you want to call it. Yeah, I have a program that I run and I call it the magic of mindful eating. Yeah, because I, I fully agree because I didn't really understand how this could happen. It's sometimes it just happens naturally. It doesn't have to be curated. Tell me exactly what is mindfulness? It's a word that's thrown around and I don't know that people really understand what it means. What is it in your words? Okay. So I, I need to give you the history and context for this. First of all, mindfulness became popularized in the 1980s after Jon Kabat-Zinn created the mindfulness-based stress reduction workshops uh, programs at UMass Worcester. And these eight-week groups were for people really suffering from chronic pain, at the end of chronic pain, where no one could help them, and they were on medications that were draining them. And this revolutionary way of being with the pain, as opposed to, let's see how we can get rid of it, was so effective that other clinicians started creating other mindfulness-based programs for other chronic disorders. So anxiety, depression, and eating issues. And I think Jean Cristella was the first one to popularize it but she was one of the people who created MBEAT, I guess, right? Um, so that was the beginning of mindfulness uh, becoming popular, but like, so what is mindfulness? Is it a technique? Is it a skill? It's probably a skill, but no, it's an ancient, as you said, it's an ancient 26,000 year old practice. And it came through the Buddha. He was just a man who was, almost obsessed with wanting to know what suffering is. Why aren't people happy? Why are people discontent? Why is there so much angst? And he wanted to know what that was. So he literally sat down only with himself to see what arises. And he's been actually called one of the greatest psychologists of all time because he literally studied his mind. What's happening now? What's coming up? what makes that happen, and all that. And after intensive practice, he came to Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths is, the first one is, yes, they're suffering. People seem to be, have a lot of discontent, seem to be unhappy. Two, there's actually a cause to, to suffering. And that cause is wanting it to be different than it is or thinking it should be different than it is. I just think this is amazing information. And then that manifests in three general energies, 
One is grasping, craving, wanting, not getting enough. Another is aversion, judgment, hatred. You can see the third is in the realm of denial, ignorance, delusion. And so he says, those are the causes of suffering. Then the third noble truth is, hey, but there's a way to end suffering. And that's the Eightfold Path, which is the fourth. And so on that Eightfold Path is mindfulness, concentration, and those are the, those are the major. But the other ones, and I'll see if I can remember this, they're just normal, basic values that all people have. Right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right view, right effort, uh, right intent. I might have missed one, but it's all these aspects are parts of any treatment program for anything, right? But that's what mindfulness is about. It's about ending suffering and by deal and dealing with accepting it as it is. Because as a society, we just push it away. Exactly. You know, we don't we don't understand or many people don't accept the fact that there's suffering everywhere. Nobody is absolved of suffering. How you get through it is a choice. Is that something yeah. along the lines of what you're yeah. saying? We're, yeah, we're deeply programmed, not just this lifetime, which could be very traumatized, but all the lifetimes before you through the epigenetics, we are deeply programmed for what he called the three poisons, greed, hatred, and ignorance. These are, we're all born with it, it's not. Right, it's fault. part of, right, it's part of, you know, the epigenetics as you just shared. And our job, if we choose that job, is to decondition ourselves. We're deeply conditioned, and through a certain intentional practice, we can be unconditioned. So what is, is that, that cool? like? Yes. And it's a, Lifelong practice, practice you, you never get there. <laughs> <laughs> and the practice, and that the word practice is so important because it gives you the space to deviate, make mistakes, learn as you go, that it is not about perfection, it is about the progress within the practice. Yeah, that's a very simple idea, just practice. And you know, you kind of touched on, you know, is mindful eating a skill or a technique? We, you kind of mentioned it. Do you have an opinion of which one it is or is it both? No, it's a factor on the path towards liberation. It's a practice. It's not, obviously everything is, a, I mean, it takes some skill to get myself. It takes some, it takes all kinds of things. But, but it's, it, I want people to understand that it's up on the path towards liberation. It's not like a way to get better or right. to gain weight. Okay, to... because when you're talking about a skill or a technique, there's a methodology. And you're going to get there. And you're going to get there. When we talk about the word practice, it is a process. It's an ever-continuing step-by-step practice, and which allows you to say, some days you are more connected to the practice. Some days you may struggle. What can you learn from the, from the days that you are more connected? And what do you learn from the days where you're more disconnected? Yeah, I mean, different people take on practice in different ways. So there is no best. It's what's best for you, allowing, mm -hmm. that, allowing your mind to be the expert. Mm -hmm. One of the common phrases I hear from a new client is, I want to lose weight first and then practice mindful eating. Tell me how you work with your clients or how you address that. First of all, that's a very good idea. <laughs> natural. It sounds practical. It's, it sounds good. But it, it literally doesn't work. Uh, dieting and, and mindfulness are literally antithetical. They're, they're different paradigms. You can't mix them. But if we go back to the causes of suffering, the cause of suffering is wanting it to be different. So when you're engaging in dieting, i.e. wanting it to be different, you are literally causing suffering. It's like you can't like beat someone up into compliance and then say, now that you've complied, complied I'll be nice to you. I'll be mindful to you. I'll be respectful. 
doesn't How's work that, that going to work? It doesn't. There's rebellions and... Um, Yeah. Just the way that you explained it is it doesn't work to be to beat yourself into submission and then offer kindness. You don't gain anything in that practice. So what we're saying is skip that part because we, we know for a fact it doesn't work. What would it look like to shift to something that you can practice and, and experiment with and to see if you can find the difference in how you work with yourself. Yes, and to understand that that paradigm will cause suffering. When you're in a paradigm that says the power is out there and you have to bow to authority instead of being in a, in a paradigm where you know that, you're, that I am the expert of eating, instead of being in a paradigm where I'm not allowed to have pleasure, or if I do, it's guilty, secret pleasure, as opposed to I'm allowed to have pleasure. Being, instead of being in a paradigm where um, it's about the quality of your relationship with your body, as opposed to sacrificing the quality of relationship in order to lose weight, you can see where you're going. And you're going nowhere. Well, it's, I think you're going deeper. You're going, right. You're definitely going it's, deeper, and it creates a, downward a, greater, a greater disorder. Right. I know from personal experience how normalized dieting has become in our society. I didn't realize how severe my own disordered eating patterns were until I became engaged in the practice of intuitive and mindful eating. Can you share what the differences are between healthy eating and disordered eating? Because disordered eating has become so normalized. Well, disordered means against the natural order. So the natural order is to be in tune with your body and know when you're hungry and sort of know what you want to eat and taste it and know when you've had enough and then toddle off. I mean, as any child would do. Um, let's see, did I answer your question? So tell me the question again. That's okay. Trying to really discern the difference between quote unquote healthy eating and disordered eating. Because mm -hmm. in today's world, many people have disordered eating patterns and they don't even understand yeah. that they are disordered. I, mean, I thought my eating was perfectly normal and it was rigid, and extraordinarily regimented with a whole lot of cans, can'ts, shoulds, shouldn'ts, right, wrong, judgmental. And weren't you suffering from that? Wasn't it a lot was, of headspace taken up with that? Yes, and you don't know it until you're out of it, mm -hmm. because, it had be, because it had become so normalized. Yeah. I, I, I mean, until someone knows they're suffering, it's hard hard for them to know. So that's why this program is here. That's why the word is out Yeah, it's, that it could be different. I mean, I would go out to a restaurant with my family and I think my kids would just want to crawl underneath the table because I would torture the poor, mm -hmm. you know, wait staff of, you know, this is what I want, but I want it this way. I'm not mm -hmm. going to have it that way. Can you do this? Can you do that? And I just, I just did it. Like I, I lived that way for years, and it was my normal. I didn't know that it really was not normal because that's all that I saw. And if you ate other things, you know, if other people around me ate other things, it came with a lot of judgment from my own mind. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting how we can shift our thoughts based on what we're learning and consuming. Right, so I think that's the very, it's very important to have education out there because you wouldn't have known it unless you got into the field of studying about it. Um, some people are very aware that they're suffering. It's, I didn't realize until I started working with clients and seeing their suffering. And that's where the light bulb really started to switch because I started out as thinking I was gonna be the best health and wellness coach helping people lose weight. And then I, as working with my clients, they would be making such great progress in different actions and behaviors only to feel defeated 
based on a number on a scale. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. was a mirror image of what my life was like. And I couldn't hold space or cause harm is how I felt that I was doing by having that metrics of weight loss on the table. And I discovered Hayes, health at every size, intuitive eating, mindful eating, and the whole practice changed my life personally and professionally. So I'm so glad that these different forms have made themselves very public. Absolutely. Health at every size. Yeah. yeah. Um, how does mindful eating help people struggling with disordered eating and the connection with body image issues? How do all of those three things go together? Um, well, there's the research on, on mindful eating uh, shows that there is um, uh, decreased frequency of binges being out of control. There's a greater sense of that if I'm not being in control, that somehow I'm magically in control. Uh, there seems to be a decrease in anxiety and depression. That is one other factor now. What could that be? Um, uh, well, and there's an increased awareness of satiety and hunger. So these are empowering. Okay. Um, the practice tries, doesn't really include body image. I mean, doesn't like, um, it's very hard to trans transmit actually, but when you become the expert of your own needs, then your body will become what it's supposed to be. So it's about acceptance. It, in the mindfulness practice, it's literally about acceptance in the moment. So if I have a fat body or a um, crooked body, <laughs> as I do, uh, I, it's, um, I note that discomfort, but I don't dwell on it. Because I know that if I dwell on wanting to change something, that I will cause suffering. That's the most important thing I want everyone to that hear. That was the most important statement yeah, right there. Right if there. You could just repeat that one more time. If one is unhappy with the present moment and wants it to change, what you do will cause suffering. Regardless of what your intentions are, by the way, because most people have good intentions, right? They have good intentions, but it will cause suffering. So focusing on body image is sort of a waste of time. There is a concept. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, and what you're sharing is, you know, just because I've gone through this personally, that... It is about a lot, you know, for me personally, it's a lot of intentional thoughts that that negative body image will creep into my mind. And I know just because of my practice and professional training, I have a choice. I can go down that rabbit hole and cause that suffering, or I can choose a better thought. And it takes time. We are not talking, it goes back to practice. We are not talking about, no. here's the rules do this thing and tomorrow you're going to magically feel better yeah. that it is a step-by-step -step process and it's not about going backwards but sometimes you end up going sideways yeah <laughs> i'll say yes to that okay <laughs> right. um, diet mentality how does that keep people stuck when you think about not diet mentality what comes to your mind well, it's another way of answering the same question. Diet mentality takes away all your power. And then, and, and, and don't forget, diet mentality um, is highly reinforced by forces which profit from you not being comfortable in your body. So people are profiting from you. <laughs> so tell us, you know, where does that diet mentality come from? Where does it start? Hmm. Different people have different stories. I mean, I have clients who 
by the time they were five, their mother was telling them what they couldn't eat, and they just learned that if, if they were fat, they would be unacceptable. And so they've been conditioned not to listen to themselves from the very beginning. That's a start. Other people come to it at different points in their life when they uh, read, start reading media and compare themselves. Oh, I'm not good enough. Um, other people have trauma. A lot of us have trauma. And don't forget, eating for reasons other than hunger, uh, eating for emotional reasons, it can work in a way. It can shut you down. It can make you temporarily, I guess we look forward to, oh boy. It can do all kinds of things. I remember one client telling me that she was a kid and she could steal food before she went to bed and was very neglected. And she said, I'm going to have a party in my mouth. So it, there's an emotional link between food. And, and, and sometimes it's a really useful tool. Absolutely. Imagine if you didn't have that tool to alleviate the suffering. I wouldn't whether... call it a tool, but I think it's somehow um, eating is a drive. It's so connected to emotions and everything that it's, a, it's sort of a natural thing to eat, to comfort yourself. Taking away the power of the tool that it, it at that negative is that it is a natural experience to be able to want to soothe yourself. It's an absolute natural experience. And if you haven't had the experience of being comforted by a caretaker, it fills a void. If you haven't had the experience of being allowed to experience your rage or your anger or your disappointment, and it's OK, you just can't break the chair. I mean, but um, I'm, many of us have not had have not learned how to regulate ourselves. And it's a way so, to create self-regulation. Yes, absolutely. And that is not a negative, is that it is something that you know how to do for yourself. Yeah. And it's learning other, other processes to be able to create soothing in addition to food. Yes. Um, Let me see how I want to say this. It's, it's not our fault if we've developed this using food, but it causes suffering is the problem. It causes all kinds of side effects. So then we get mad at ourselves. So, so it doesn't work in the end. Right. It works until it doesn't work. But um, the way I see it, food is a great comfort. So when I'm deciding what I want to eat, when I'm checking in with what I want to eat, uh, my mood will determine what spices or what texture or what temperature. So a good soup would be comforting if I want that comfort, if I want to be jazzed up or I want to like fight on something. So it's, it's, food can and should be part of the mix of comforting and bringing yourself joy and anticipation. Oh boy, my, a birthday cake. Oh boy, you know without the mental drama that goes behind it. Yeah. Understand you can it. have it all. Well. You, can have your, you can have your cake and eat it exactly. too. Exactly. You know, have your cake and eat it too. Exactly. And it's about trying to understand what's going to satisfy you physically, mentally, and emotionally. Yes. And you have the internal resources to do that. And it's learning to trust yourself that you have those resources. It's also taking the time. Time is and a problem. Many. Many people don't make the time or take the time. I'm not sure if I saw it and wanted, uh, whatever, if you're too busy. Well, good. sometimes you're too busy, but how could you always be too busy that you can't give time to eat? If you understood what a sacred uh, act eating is, I mean, we're 100% dependent upon food. Non-negotiable. Yeah. How do you want to treat that which you are 100% Dependent on you want to go, meh, meh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm, it's such a big picture, but it's about bringing respect and gratitude towards the eating. How do you change that? It's learning to change your relationship on, you know, with the food and with your values of what's important to create your best future being or your present future, your present being. And we view food 
in so many different categories that when we start to understand that we are 100% dependent on it, how do we make that relationship one that is respectful, nourishing, satisfying? And that does bring us joy. I, first of all, would surround myself with like people. I would listen to the show. I would get a nutritionist or a coach, or I would get a therapist. I would, um, there's so much, so much information out there about how to uh, work with food. And I do want to mention the Center for Mindful Eating, because they're really a forefront of this now. Uh, worldwide organization of trying to bring mindful eating to the fore and to expand it to the whole of it. You know, so I mean, I, I practice a grace. I, I, I teach it to my children and grandchildren because it's a teaching tool in itself. We thank the sun, the wind, the earth, the rain for this beautiful food where it depends on all this, all the creatures who gave their lives to feed us, all the human effort that went into bringing it to us. And may we take it in and may it nourish us so that we can return the energy to the world in ways which lessen suffering and bring joy. My mind, that says it all. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's a big picture. And it's, I, and I could just feel, listening to you speak, I could just feel that in my body. Yeah. I mean, it's what a lovely way to be able to have an eating experience because you've already elevated the experience. Doesn't matter what you're eating. Doesn't matter what it, you're it eating. It does not make a difference. It's how you create that relationship with whatever it is that you are eating. Exactly. Can you tell us the difference between intuitive and mindful eating? And I, well, again, mindfulness is this. That's why, why, that's why I spent all that time. Mindfulness is, is a practice on the path so, uh, but you can be mindful in this moment or how, how do your feet feel? You know, we can be mindful in any moment. So intuitive eating uses mindfulness. Uh, intuitive eating is a fabulous compilation of the whole thing, uh, differentiating hunger, uh, nutritional hunger from emotional hunger. So all I knew when I first came into the field was, wow, I'm in charge of myself. I mean, I know when I have enough. But I never actually thought, well, if I don't eat when I'm hungry and I really wait till I'm too hungry, how am I going to eat? Or, or what is fueling this desire to eat? So um, uh, intuitive eating is, is a beautiful model. That book is old. We, I, that was one of the texts uh, we used when I was working for feeding ourselves uh, in God knows when. <laughs> all the, the years 80s. start to, all the years start to blend together. <laughs> but anyway, that's, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful way of breaking it down. They work well together. Totally. They go hand in hand. I know you're trained in internal family systems. Can you tell me what that, what internal family systems actually is? So internal family systems is a psycho spiritual model developed by Dr. Richard Schwartz in the 80s. Um, the spiritual aspect of it is that IFS recognizes that inner leader, that intuitive place. It recognizes it, that it's there and that the potential is that the leader heals you. Like from yourself you can heal. And the other part of it, it recognizes all the multiplicity of parts, all the hurt, wounded, shamed, hidden parts, and the parts that try to manage it. And then the parts when they can't manage it go crazy and hit someone or eat a pie or you know what I mean, compulsive things. So the internal family systems, I started studying that in 2004 and I went, I finally have a way to deal with the resistance to mindful eating. Because when I ask most of my clients to sit still, they'll sit still and all, they're, all they'll hear is their critic berating them and they can't stand it. So then they have to douse it. it so it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful way of compassionately looking at all the aspects and the three poisons, he calls it the three poisons of the Buddha, but 
uh, internal family systems really understands that both greed, hatred, and delusion are desperately trying to protect our wounded places. So it's a way to help break down this resistance, not break down, um, have the resistance relax. And it helps. I have a couple of clients that work with therapists and they use um, IFS as well. And it's interesting when I'm working with them on how they're able to label their parts and those voices. And it empowers them to be able to have that, com that inner conversation and to be talking to the different parts and learning to talk to those different parts with kindness and compassion. And it's just fascinating to, to watch the growth when they can connect with who's saying what within their body and how, to res and how to move within that space. And the key thing is they're differentiating. It's like normally we're blended with it. Like I'm just angry and I'm just gonna. But through the pra both from mindfulness practice and through IFS, you can start to differentiate and see that as a distinct entity. I see so much more compassion with that practice when they are struggling with the negative and the critic that they're yeah. strengthening the kindness and the compassion, and that's where they start to be able to move, make more progress or better progress moving forward. Very well said, so that when that leader, that he calls it self, you can call it intuitive, someone could call it spirit, we inherently have compassion. It's the, it's the, it's the piling up of all the conditioned defenses which obscure our true self. So in this process and other processes, the self-compassion is already there. And it's easier for people to be compassionate for others than for themselves. Is that true or not true? Based on not oh, sure. Yeah, but I don't know if that's really compassion. I, 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 I'm being cynical here, but. That's okay, tell me. Um, I think it's very important to, that you deliver and take in and ex have self-compassion for yourself. Oh, uh, I, I think people can, can act very well and have empathy for other people. Act. But, that was an interesting choice of words. Yeah. Many people know how to act the right way. To, uh, I know many people who say the right thing, say they, they're 10 times better than I am at saying the right thing. But they just some, somehow pulled it from You don't the find the authenticity or the felt sense when it's sometimes delivered, that they know the right things. It doesn't mean that they feel it and it's genuine and authentic and from the heart. Right. I'm not sure what you're getting at here, but um, I think self-compassion is is much more important. Being able to give it out, that's great. Right, that's, that, that is my point, is it's easy for us to say the right thing yes. to offer compassion to someone else. How do we bring that sense of compassion with authenticity and kindness to come and bring it into ourselves? So that's why I think a practice uh, inherent in mindfulness, by, by the way, is the teaching of, of loving kindness that's also ancient. It's coming back and popular because I think in this time we need more self-compassion because all you have to do is look at an ad or Facebook and you go, oh, I feel like, oh. And so they're bringing it forth. They're magnifying it as a process, but it's always been there. And I see it. It's a practice, but I see it. It's priming the pump to access what's already there. But why should I feed myself? Oh, you're not good enough. Well, you're not good enough. You're not. If, if I nourish myself with compassion, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. What is self-led eating? I know it's a term that I've seen so used. So I, I coined that. Other people are using it because it's a no-brainer. Because he, cause the, the um, result of or the intention of internal family assistance is to be self-led. It's like, an, it's like the conductor of an orchestra, an orchestra without a conductor, all playing different pieces, or a conductor. So self-leadership, the person here who knows, like, if a part says, I'm hungry and I'm sad and I'm this and that. Okay, 
We're hungry and sad, but we're 20 miles from a restaurant. We're driving, you know. So I'll make sure to stop as soon as we can. Oh, and I discovered some snacks here. And we'll, you know, it's how to talk to yourself, how to talk to all the parts of you. With kindness. With kindness. And um, uh, to respond appropriately to them. Kindness so, is such yeah. an important word. Yeah, kindness. It, that's, that's the kindness. But so self-led eating is eating from that place of, of inner authority. Listening to that, listening to those cues, listening to those voices, and responding with that kindness and that compassion. Yeah. What simple mindfulness practices can people start today to become more mindful? Today? Today. <laughs> Somebody who's listening. Somebody who's listening and, and they've already discarded that conversation of, I'm not going to diet first. I'm ready to start mm -hmm. the practice of mindful eating. Where do they start? Well, in this day and age, especially thanks to COVID, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> there are so many ways you can access uh, mindfulness teachings. Uh, Headspace, Insight Timer, um, like I'm, I'm blanking. But you can always find someone to teach you, right? And then, of course, there's groups and there's centers. Um, so if you look up a course or a class or a webinar, you can find that. And I think that's a very good thing to do. Also, there's groups. There's, there's organizations. There's... Uh, a, a lot of my colleagues who are nutritionists run groups. Right. Um, and if they don't have access to, you know, everybody has different financial means. Mm. What about the person who is suffering by themselves and are ready to take that small step? What does that first step mm. practice look like for them? Well, you could, uh, first of all, you could, Try to sit still and see what that feels like, but you could make your eating a sacred place. First of all, make an intention, even one day a week. You could make the intention to sit down calmly at a table that doesn't have bills on it. Because that right. does not help calmness. Sit down calmly when you're hungry. And I would use the technique of Notice your intention to pick up the utensil or pick up the sandwich and just go from there. Or you could take three mindful bites by doing that and chewing, tasting, swallowing, waiting for it to go down. Um, it would be good to do a little relaxation before eating. Grounding. And grounding, certainly, or, or shaking out or something like that. But to practice with the food, uh, it, it could just be one, it could be one strawberry. It could be right. that, the, the point is, is that it could be that simple. It doesn't need to be overcomplicated. Right. And that step one is all you need is intention to do something a little mm -hmm. bit different. And again, like intuitive eating, all these books, all of our, uh, there's plenty of books. There's so many books. Intuitive eating. To there's... tell you how to eat mindfully. So I wouldn't do it without any support. Though. And support does make a difference. It's, you know, we can read as, you know, we can all read. Getting the support to have these conversations, to unpack what's going on in your head, how to, how to understand how to make those shifts, how to have set those goals, set practices. It does make a difference. I mean, as a coach, I see it all the mm -hmm. time. People know what to do. It's different when you have somebody helping you go through that process. I think it's very important to have help. Yeah. However, however, whatever you can, you can get, get it. How can the practice of mindful eating, you know, what do you say to the person who is on the go, in the car, transporting their kids? And I know we touched on it a little bit, you know, how could you be busy 24 seven? How do you deal though with the busyness during the day and mindful eating? Can they, can they be together? Well, they have to be together, but um, I, I just can't imagine why there really isn't time to stop and eat. 
Because I it's think that, we make the busyness because I, I know people who have nothing going on. And they're, they're so busy. too busy, too busy to sit down and eat or they can't validate eating so they have to read or watch the television. So I think it's really a mind state. If you're actually too busy, then you do whatever the heck you can. But the idea that we eat in the car or that, or that we don't have time to eat is a mistake. And that's our own story. How do we look at our story and really validate is that true or can you kind of start to poke holes exactly. is that in true? that story? But that's one of the biggest uh, explanations of why I can't. Right. Because I'm too busy. How do you take a step back and gain a different perspective? Because we can all shift our thoughts and understand our priorities and our values. When we shift our relationship to eating and healing and it becomes a priority, all of a sudden something else you become a little bit too busy for. Is that serving you the way that improving your relationship to your food and body will serve you? Well, you're bringing up values and then the rest of his eightfold path is those values. I mean, what are your values? It's, and it starts says, I just want to be thin. <laughs> <laughs> right. Shut up, I just want to be thin. Right. right. So and just to sit and look at what your values are. Connect, you know, again, going back to being quiet, connecting to yourself, listening listening to those voices questioning those voices are they serving you how do they make you feel what's actually happening are you living your best present experience as best you can as best you can at that moment in time yeah so one doesn't really know how does one have to know how to formally meditate to eat mindfully Well, I have an opinion on, first of all, many people practice eating mindful and they don't formally meditate. But I think unless I had those four years of prior practice, I would never have had the, um, the skill, the ability to focus so intently. So I personally think that a practice of some sort is very helpful. But still, there's no reason why one can't practice right here. Here's the food that I'm hungry for. How can I respect it? How can I pay attention to everything that's happening? You can deepen your practice with the more, with, with all the, with the accumulation of the practice, the practice itself gets deeper and more connected. Yeah. Tell us about the workshops and programs that you've created around mindful eating, because I know that in your intro, I mentioned a few, and I'm so interested in everything that you're offering. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, okay, the only thing that I'm really doing right now is the Conscious Cafe, at, and it's on the Center for Mindful Eating the first Tuesday of every, any, every month, not any month, every month. <clears throat> Anybody's welcome, you have to register, and that's an hour or so practice of we eat mindfully together. So that's a wonderful support. Talk about support. My other workshop, which, which I used to do, were they had different names given the time because in the beginning I, I did not feel qualified to use the word mindfulness because who am I? You know, and so I first called it body intelligence that was my first thing. And one group was coming to our senses about food. But, but they were all the same. They all facilitated, uh, uh, they facilitated the actual experience of eating mindfully and discovering your own satiety. Preceded by knowing what hunger is, differentiating hunger from emotional needs, all that jazz. But they were all sort of the same. I love how you said that you didn't want to use the word mindfulness or mindful eating because you didn't feel that you were qualified. And it's, it's something that I resonate a lot with of where you feel like you know something, like you feel confident that you know it, but you're afraid to put your own label on it that you are the expert. And all these years later, what, what was the defining moment that said, you are the expert and I can say, I teach mindful eating. Well, I say I'm mindfulness based and what? 
I don't know, because, you know, there are teachers of the Dharma, and I am not qualified for that. <laughs> that's, a whole other, that's a whole I'm other level of, the, of learning. So I want to make very clear that I'm not that, but I have found a process. and I'm on the path, is what I am, and I can help someone else be on the path with me. And, that, and there's a joy in mindfulness. Oh, there is. So I'd like to share that. For sure. And before you tell us about this week's practice, are there any other words of wisdom that you would like to share to help people heal their relationship with food? Hmm, that's a few. Well, so we're talking about a relationship. Any relationship um, with something that you're dependent upon, it could be very problematic if it's not safe. So it is really important to look at it that way. So um, what we're really looking for is to feel safe, satisfied, powerful, in charge, um, pleasure, but, but safe. And that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for to control. So that's what I wish for everyone. And that's what it's about. It's not about losing weight. And remember, if you try anything else, it will lead to suffering. Keeping ourselves in safety. So learning, the to learning, learning how to have that conversation with yourself to keep yourself in safety. Yeah, but I want to say something about relationship. Um, we've learned to have these dysfunctional relationships. We've had these unsafe relationships with our caretakers. Again, so food, parents, all connected. So have a lot of compassion for yourself about where you are on that continuum. We all work so hard at, or many of us work hard about with our relationships with other people. How do we shift that focus to have that relationship with ourselves that is one of loving and nurture, kindness and compassionate, because that's the pathway to alleviating suffering. And if that's in your values, if that's then there's, there's a path to do that. And there's a lot of people like you and me who want to support that. Absolutely. That journey. Absolutely. Um, so please share your practice for this week. I've actually <laughs> was deciding what that is. So I thought um, it's not so much a practice as how to be aware of this. So why don't, um, if you do it with me, can you change your posture and uh, wiggle around a little and, and, and get in your body? You can feel your supports on the chair and your feet on the floor. And what if, what if we just pretended we were dignified? What if we just adopted a posture of dignity? Excuse me. Pretend. And then notice that your body is breathing all by itself. And isn't that cool? And invite softness, kindness, and clarity to this moment. And I would like to check it out. Is what the Buddha said true? So let's talk about the realm of relationship with food and body. Do you see that there's a part of you that wants it to be different? Just notice, is there a part of you, us, that wants the body to be different? Just acknowledge that. And then check out, check out 
are there ways in which there's craving, grasping, wanting, lack of satisfaction? Are there ways of pushing away, hating, judging, controlling? Are there ways of being in denial in your relationship with food and body or ignorance? Like if I do this, I'll lose 50 pounds in two days. I think it would be good to notice these forces in ourselves. Recognize what's running your internal system. And then recognize there is a way to be liberated. Say to yourself, may I be safe and protected? May I be happy? May I live with ease and with kindness? May I love and be loved? Just notice what it feels like to reflect in this way. And so just notice what you're aware of right now, how that felt to know what all the parts that are running around in you and that there's an option. And take a nice big breath and feel that body again. And come back here, but we can keep our dignity. Well, that was lovely in so many different ways. Mm. And noticing, you know, personally, I've had a challenging few days. And just that reminder of that kindness and self-talk just shifts your entire mindset. It's amazing, the it's powerful basic, of it? just the simplicity of just being and changing those thoughts and how powerful they are. So thank you for that Amen. beautiful practice. Okay. So I'm trying to regain my composure here and to finish up. Um, today we have learned about mindful eating and how it is one of the key components of letting go of the diet mentality and finding peace with your food. If you're looking to continue the conversation, please visit me um, for my monthly office hours, my conversations, and I'm always welcoming your thoughts um, on what you are learning and gaining from these impactful and powerful conversations with my guests. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time on Getting Healthy Without Rules.